after Stephen's death in chapter 7, we now move on to the section where God's people are scattered, which has actually been a beneficial thing for the congregation because they gossiped the gospel all over the, the earth. In Acts 1, verse 21 to 25, we have an introduction, the scattered abroad except the apostles, and the Samaritans accept the good news. In our study of Acts 6 and 7, we saw five important events. There was a distinction between the work of the assembly and evangelism and providing benevolence to needy saints. Even religious leaders who were in error could be taught the word of God. There would be those who would reject the word of God. Some people were strongly affected by God's word and Stephen was the first Christian martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. After the death of Stephen, there arose a great persecution against the church at Jerusalem, the ecclesia that called out. Because of the persecution, the assembly was scattered through the Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen. Saul made havoc of the ecclesia, throwing men and women into prison. The saints being scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Verse 1 says, And Saul was there, giving approval to his death. On that day a great persecution broke out against the assembly in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the ecclesia. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. We remember what accounted for this radical change in the people's attitude towards the assembly, it was because after the sermon by Stephen, they now recognised that what had happened among them was not a welcome, vital new development in Judaism, but an entirely new faith, which said that the old religion in which they had trusted no longer served any purpose. Its purpose had been fulfilled. The covenant which God had made with their fathers at Sinai had been replaced by a new covenant. The sacrifices and ceremonies of the old religion now had no purpose because they were a shadow of something better to come, which had now come. The priest of Aaron, with its high priest, no longer had a role to fulfil, because Jesus had become a priest like Melchizedek. The temple was not the centre of the worship of God, as they had always believed. They were no longer the unique, exclusive people of God. It says Saul consented to the death of Stephen, consented to take pleasure with others in anything to approve or to agree with. Later in life, Saul, Paul, was very sorry for this and his other actions. Also later in life, he would become a penitent, prayerful, powerful preacher of God's word. But first, we must see him as a persistent persecutor. Because of the martyrdom of Stephen, the Jewish leaders were emboldened to launch out on a great persecution of the assembly because they now felt confident that for the first time they had the Jewish population of Jerusalem on their side. We can imagine the feelings of outrage and anger which the Jews now experienced. They turned against the followers of Jesus. The priests and leaders of the nation took advantage of this change of attitude in order to launch an onslaught on them. We recall that up to that time the disciples enjoyed popular support. As you see in chapters 2, 47, 5, 13, etc., the Jewish leaders had been forced to tread very carefully, lest they upset the people. Not any longer. The leaders were delighted that they now had evidence that this new sect, as they called it, was a danger, a threat, which had to be put down at all cost and by any means. The martyrdom of Stephen marks the beginning of a general persecution of the church. Many disciples leave Jerusalem from other parts. But their enemies are still hesitant to attack the twelve apostles, probably because they have seen God's intervention to rescue them, and because most of the common people like the miracles of healing. The persecution drove the saints back to their home countries preaching the word. Consider the benefits of trials and persecutions within our lives. Have they made a difference? Paul thought that tribulation produces perseverance. The key to enduring persecution and tribulation is not to give up. Instead, we need to finish the race. 
The eighth chapter is most des uh, mostly a description of the evangelistic ministry in Samaria of Philip, one of the seven chosen to serve in Acts chapter 6. In the Great Commission, Jesus had told his disciples to spread fast in Jerusalem and Judea, then in Samaria, and after that they were to go out into the entire world. Since Jerusalem was being evangelized, the disciples now also seen going to Judea and Samaria. Saul was giving approval. A great persecution breaks out. All except the apostles are scattered. Godly men bury Stephen. The first verse of chapter 8 would seem to go better with chapter 7. We meet Saul as a leader of the persecution in the church. As you know, he had a life-changing experience on the road to Damascus as he was going there to capture and bring believers back to Jerusalem to stand trial before the Sanhedrin. But Jesus appeared to him and changed his life, he gave him instructions as to what he must do, and we'll read that about in chapter 9. The last chapter closed with martyrdom of Stephen. The church had already been under some persecution, but until now there had been a boundary line beyond which the Jewish authorities had not been willing to cross. This was now changed. There was a new outlook. It wasn't in favour of the Christians. Notice the adjectives that are used. Great persecution. All scattered. Loud lamentation. Things just weren't bad. They were very bad. Stephen had been executed. Others were being arrested and imprisoned. The reasoning of Stephen was completely ignored. The only thing people heard was that this man represented a faith which was against God and Moses and the temple and the customs. The opposition now turns from defensive to the offensive. The leadership of persecution passes from Sadducees to Pharisees. Saul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The opposition swept on upon the disciples with a fierceness that had not been known before. There would be no more trials, no more defences, the cause of Christ was condemned in a wholesale manner that permitted no hearing. Eventually the popularity of the new movement presented to the mind of the Jews a real threat to their power and their prestige. It did indeed, for had been the ecclesia, uh, if for had the ecclesia been left to continue its march, all Jerusalem could have been bowed at the feet of Jesus. Now this showed the Jewish leaders in a new light. They were the defenders of orthodoxy against the attacks of this new sect. They were the ones who stood for the protection of the old faith. They now believed they could depend on the people for their support and whatever they did to put down this new heresy. Prison isn't a very pleasant place. There's no air conditioners and colour televisions in these prisons. They're often disease infested, cold, dark and damp. This was a reign of terror that precluded all civil rights. Remember Hitler's, Hitler's Gestapo? This is a similar situation. Jewish Christians were being dragged away to concentration camps. Saul of Tarsus was to be to the Christians what Hitler would be to the Jews. Saul was a driven man. He was sincere in his persecution of Christians. But sincerity is no substitute for truth. Persecution rose against the assembly. The Greek ecclesia, the Aramaic is Edata, the Hebrew cognate of Edata is Eda, congregation, assembly in Strong's 57 verse 12 word numbers. Unfortunately, it's mistranslated as church from the Greek Kyriake in our modern Bibles. We actually use the word church in the wrong way. We should really use the word assembly or congregation or the called out, which is really what assembly, ecclesia means. Ecclesia is used nearly 150 times, frequently seen as assembly, or congregation of Israel, or congregation of Yahweh, or congregation of... All scattered except the apostles. I think it was God's plan that all 12 of the apostles stay in Jerusalem for a while to maintain a unified front in order to get the assembly off to a good start. Note that as the disciples were scattered, they didn't go under cover or hide. But wherever they went, they preached the, go the word. One translation says, gossiping the gospel. Was the persecution in God's plan to disperse the disciples? Compare this to what happened at the Tower of Babel. 
<coughs> the people in the story of Genesis 11 built the tower so they could not be scattered on the, over the earth. <coughs> God had told man that he wanted them to be scattered over the earth, to multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it. I'm sure God didn't want these thousands of disciples to stay in Jerusalem forever. When the builders of the Tower of Babel would not scatter and fill the earth, God confused their language and this scattered them. In Acts you have the story of people who came from many lands to build a new tower. This tower in Jerusalem was a tower of power and unity, unifying the world in one body to speak a single language of spiritual truth. Verse 2 says, Godly men buried Stephen. The passage doesn't say these devout men were Christians. They may well have been Jews who did not approve of the actions of Sanhedrin and stoning Stephen. The Mishnah states that when a man who had been stoned is buried, there is no mourning on his behalf. These men were in direct violation of the Pharisaic tradition. They did not approve of the decision to murder Stephen, and so they mourned. This is a picture of a cemetery just outside the walls of Jerusalem. Stephen must have been buried near Jerusalem, but no one knows where his grave is now. Perhaps it is a cemetery just outside the walls of Jerusalem as shown in the picture. But the ossuaries of bone boxes of James, brother of Jesus, and Caiaphas, the high priest mentioned in Acts, have been found and identified, although there's still some question about the authenticity of James' ossuary. Since Christians view death as simply a translation to a better place, is it okay to mourn? Well, Jesus wept when Judas died, not so much at the death of Judas, uh, uh, death of Lazarus, but at the consequences of death, at the impact upon all those who uh, suffer loss when a, a loved one dies. We need to learn to rejoice with those who rejoice. We learn, need to learn to mourn with those who mourn. Brief often brings opportunity, but there should be no opportunity for grief. Saul was there, giving approval to his death, and that day a great persecution arose. Godly men buried Stephen, mourning deeply. Saul was there, giving approval to the death, a great persecution issued. The family is scattered. Verse 3 says that even at this time, he was ravaging the assembly. The Osai version says, Saul made havoc of the Lord's church. Incidentally, this is the only time that the word havoc or ravage, the cause of the New Testament, made havoc of the Lord's family. This word was used to describe the destruction of victims committed by wild and savage beasts, thrown to uh, savage beasts sometimes. In other words, Paul viciously attacked the assembly with the intention of utterly destroying it. Saul was a spearhead. In all this all-out campaign, he left no stone unturned. Notice how God describes Saul's evil efforts. Entering every house, methodical, organized, a massive effort to destroy as he drags off men and women and put them in prison. He drags them off, forcing both men and women to leave their homes and places of worship, committing them to prison. Remember 2 Timothy 3 verse 12? We cannot help thinking of what he heard and saw Stephen himself and the actions of these devout men remaining with him and helping to prepare him for that meeting with Jesus in the road to Damascus. There should be no opportunity for grief. Anyone who chooses to live a life for God will ultimately have to contend with a culture of aggression. People won't like what we say. Being missionary minded is an attitude that calls for godliness in the midst of ungodliness. People will not just listen to what we say, but they'll listen to and watch what we do. The missionary minded community must be different from the culture in which it bears witness. Matthew chapter 5 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city of hell cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Did Paul persecute people while having a good conscience? Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God and with all good conscience to this day. Acts 23 verse 1 says, My conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. 1 Corinthians 4 4 says. From tragedy to transformation. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the gospel to Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits go out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. By the time Saul was done, the Jerusalem assembly had shrunk from thousands, and the twelve apostles and assembly had been so big, was now so small. Had God failed? No. Instead of one big assembly, there were now hundreds of small ones. The assembly in Jerusalem had been enjoying some phenomenal success. It had grown greatly over the years. With this, a new problem had come. It was a problem of complacency, perhaps. There was no longer any urgency to preach the gospel to other people. They had become insular in their thinking. To tell you the truth, the believers didn't even conceive of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. Indeed, they were not really inter interested in taking to the Jews who lived in other countries. They had become lax. If a God used this persecution to stir up the assembly, to spread it out to other nations. How many mission reports have we had that are full of glowing successes? Revivals and mission conferences are presented in such a way they often glorify the workers instead of the Lord. And this can be very intimidating. Not all of us enjoy apparent success. Often the reverse is true. We are undergoing hardship and failure. This does not mean that God is not working in our lives, often just the opposite. God often works through our failures. Up to this point, the church had been confined to the area immediately around Jerusalem. The church had become a potpourri. It sat there. It did good works, but it's not moving out into the world. Now the Lord turns on the heat. It becomes a pressure cooker. Have you ever seen a pot full of water begin to boil? As the water expands and doesn't remain in the pot, the assembly was like that. As the heat was turned up, people began to get out of town. Oliver Cromwell sent his men into Catholic churches to search for funds for his beleaguered nation. They came back saying, We found no gold or silver except that which was in the statues of the saints. Good, he replied. We will melt down the saints and put them into circulation. <laughs> this is what God did with the persecution of the early church. As a result, those who scattered went abroad preaching the word. This is not the apostles who were doing this preaching. This is everybody except the apostles. There's a lesson here. It is that evangelism is everybody's responsibility. This is a pivotal point in the history of the church. It didn't happen till Acts 1 happened. When the going got tough, the tough left town. But as they left, they took with them the message of the gospel. This reflects a dramatic change in the program of God. Up to this time, the knowledge of God had been primarily focused in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a single beacon of light which was to draw all nations to herself. This is what happened at Pentecost. Jews from all nations gathered together to meet the Lord. Now all change. Instead of the world coming to the church, now the church will go to the world. Those who have been scattered preached the word everywhere they went, wherever they went. It's interesting to note the word scattered, both verse 1 and verse 4, is the Greek word diasperentes. It's a compound word made of dia, from, and sparentes to scatter. What is interesting that sparentes is used in Matthew 13 to describe the actions of the sower who goes out and sows his seed, literally the scatterer who goes out to scatter his seed. Those who have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. In the midst of tragedy, we need to learn to speak the word, because it's not tragedy, but the word of God that transforms people. The message of the mission-minded is not that there is hope in the midst of tragedy, rather there is hope in the transforming power of God. Those who scattered preached the word wherever they went. The word which is translated preaching is laluntis. The usual word for to preach is the word evangelizo. The formal presenta presentation of a message, a proclaiming of the message. 
But this word is used of speaking and even gossiping. They went everywhere gossiping the gospel. They are, these family followers of Jesus would not be stopped by threats, beatings, imprisonment, not even by death. How much they must have loved the Lord, loved his word, and loved his called out people, his family. We need more people like them today, and that includes you and me. As you've seen time and again in our study, the persecution doesn't stop dedicated disciples of Jesus. Nothing stops dedicated disciples of Jesus. Instead, it causes them to grow, to be more zealous in teaching others, just as it did with these Christians. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so your faith may not rest in men's wisdom, but in God's power. What is our message? Philip preached the gospel in Samaria. Many people received the teachings of Philip. Simon had convinced the people that he had the power of God. This is going to be a key event. After the people heard Philip, they believed and were baptized, it says. Simon also believed and was baptized. Go into all the world. Philip in Samaria. Philip spreads the gospel. The character of Philip. Philip is a Greek name. It was fairly common among the Greeks. It had been ever since the days of Philip, the father of Alexander the Great. This is not the same Philip who was one of the apostles. This is a different Philip. He was first introduced to us as one chosen to serve. He was named immediately after Stephen. Stephen had been the first martyr. It's Philip who has the distinction of being the first missionary. We will see him again in Acts 2, 21. When the disciples scattered through Judea and Samaria because of general persecution in Jerusalem, Philip is the one who left the city and went down to Samaria. The city itself is not named. The city of Samaria had long since been destroyed by the Assyrians. There was now another city on that site, but it was no longer called Samaria. The reference here in verse 5 is likely to one of any number of cities within the province of Samaria. Samaria was a province that lay between Judea, Judea and Galilee. It was a beautiful country with rolling hills and fertile meadows, but the Jewish people did not normally go there. The people who lived in the province of Samaria were called Samaritans. The Jews looked upon the Samaritans as a mongrel race, no better than Gentiles, and in some ways worse. These people are the descendants of intermarriages between the poorest, lowest classes of Jewish and Gentiles. They had been brought in from several countries by the Assyrians to live among them when the northern kingdom of Israel went into exile. The gospel breaks through cultural barriers. John 4, 7 says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw, draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. But his disciples got away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. John 8 says, the Jews answered and said to him, Do you not rightly say, say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? God fights against prejudice and isolationism and nationalism. Since first family, division and modest hate have characterized fallen humanity. Race, class, gender head the list. Religion often leads the way. Atheism, Islam, communism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Shintoism, Mormonism, Christianity. There's a principle here. It is that there's no room for prejudice within the people of God. An old black gentleman living in southern Georgia had become a Christian. He moved into a new area and came to worship one Lord's Day at a rather exclusive, upper-class, white congregation. But they wouldn't let him in. They wouldn't let him join in worship because he was black. He was heartbroken. And he prayed that evening, Lord, I want so bad to worship you this morning, but they would not let me in. The Lord answered his prayer and said to him, Son, I've been trying to get into that congregation for years. They wouldn't let me in either. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Probably one of the greatest lessons for our time. 
As Philip travels through Samaria, we need to realise he is crossing the barrier of hundreds of years of racial prejudice. Actors written by a Gentile, our attitude ought to be different to what is often called the post-modern anti-racist position. Postmodern modern anti-racism charges that only the majority culture is racist. <clears throat> Biblical anti-racism says all have sinned. Postmodern says calls it calls people to respect diversity. Jesus says all love all people. Postmodern modernism calls for different truths for different groups. Jesus argues for the truth which liberates all groups. Modern, postmodernism says there's moral norms, and Jesus is based on universal norms. The postmodern says it's based on power and groupment, and Jesus would say it was based on self denial for the sake of others. We should read the definite article with the word Christ. Philip was proclaimed the Christ. The Samaritans knew about the Christ. They knew the Greek word Christ is the same as the Hebrew word Messiah. They believed that Messiah was going to come and that he would teach them all things. Philip's proclamation went to the very heart of that belief. The message that Philip proclaimed was startling. He has come. The king and his kingdom have come. The Messiah for whom you've been waiting has arrived. He even came to Samaria and spoke to a woman by the well. He was crucified and buried, and then he rose again from the dead, and today he is alive. By his death, he paid for our sins. By his resurrection, he calls us to a new life, a new relationship through faith in him. <clears throat> Philip preached and performed miracles, healing various diseases and casting out demons. This was fertile ground. Jesus already ministered within Samaria. The seed had been planted. Now the season of harvest has arrived. When the harvest begins, it is a great harvest. Note the people paid attention to his words because of the signs that he did. We tend to look at this passage and be impressed with the miracles of healing and the fact that demons are being cast out and that people have been paralyzed and lame or now square dancing. But I want to suggest there was no less a miracle that the, mirac the multitudes were of one accord. It's difficult to get a multitude to do anything with one accord. That brings us to a principle. It is there needs to be unity among the pure. The people of God need to be seen to be the people of God by their unity, as Jesus prayed. That doesn't mean say we all dress the same, or look the same, or talk the same. But it does mean that we all follow the same Lord, have the same faith, and are precipitated in being born again through the blood of Christ by the same baptism. The response to Philip's preaching was one of joyful acceptance, and there was much rejoicing in the city. I love being around brand new Christians and to see the Lord through their eyes. Everything is fresh and new and exciting. Multitudes in the city of Samaria believed and were baptized. There was great joy in the city. It's an early example of conversions outside of Jerusalem. This is no small example of God's power to save. Paul taught if the word of God was preached, then God would give the increase. By this time, in the church's growth, the apostles were not only disciples, not the only disciples who could perform miracles. Stephen also had done so. Now we read about Philip doing the same. How did these men and others like them, who were not apostles, get these powers? As we will see later in the chapter, it was through the laying on of hands of an apostle that the power to perform miraculous signs was given. We'll next look at Simon the Magician.